I'm Emma Massingale, horse trainer and adventurer. I've worked and travelled with horses in some of the most rugged terrain in the UK, but now I've decided I want to try something a little bit different. Come on, let's go. I'm taking my two native Eriske ponies, Noah and Storm, back to their ancestral home in the Outer Hebrides. And for the next 20 days, my plan is to travel nearly 200 miles from Vatasse in the south to the tip of Lewis and Harris in the north. But trying something new. Eriske are too small for me to ride, so to add excitement to the journey, I've adapted a mountain board for them to pull me along. Just going to have a quick practice on this beautiful beach. I want to make sure the ponies will work together and that I can keep my balance on this board. We'll be camping as we go, meeting some of the people that work here and make these remote islands their home. Joining us is my little dog, Inca, who'll be travelling in a special backpack. Ready to go? Right then, boys. Let's go. Come, boys. From Vatase, we're heading to Barra over one of the many causeways built to connect the various islands. And my first stop is to get something for dinner tonight. Angus John Morrison is one of the island's top cockle pickers, and he's taking me to one of his favourite spots, which also serves another purpose for the island. I don't think I've searched for cockles anywhere so beautiful as this before. Well, it's nice on a nice day. It's beautiful on a nice day. Finding cockles is a simple process of raking the sand to locate the big ones. And as we start, it's not long before the beach's other role becomes apparent. That's crazy. This beautiful stretch of sand was first licensed as a runway in 1936, and it's the only beach in the world to have scheduled flights. The cockle picking is safe as long as we remain outside of the marked runway areas. So how often would you come down here cockle? I'm coming down every day. I leave cockles in the summer for the hotels, okay. and they take so many, maybe 30 or 40 kilos a week. But a lot of people do it, you know, and there's good money in it. Ah. Yes. <laughs> In the summer months, the cockles can earn Angus three pounds a kilo, but they have to be the right size. Not any smaller than that. They're so abundant on the beach that it's not long before we have enough for both Angus's hotels and my supper. They are so tasty. After a good night's rest, we're off again. Our next stop is the island of Eriske, the place where Noah and Storm's breed originate from and I shall get to see some Eriske ponies running freely. But to get there, we have to take the ferry, and unfortunately, it's a bit of a rough ride. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sunny day in the Hebrides. It's very horrible, isn't it? <laughs> Luckily, the horses are safely housed below, and after a choppy crossing, we eventually make it. Eriske is one of the smallest inhabited islands in the group, with around 150 people living here. Good boys. With no supermarkets, supplies are bought from the only shop on the island, run by Katrina Walker. Morning. Hiya. And in our case, that's dog biscuits and some fruit for the ponies. I like the, uh, hello. Hiya. How are you? This is Inca. Inca. You're yeah, having a wonderful time, are you? Normally, the wild Eriske ponies roam freely down here, but during the summer months, they're sent to the hills as they can become a bit of a nuisance. They usually go up on the 1st of May, because uh, otherwise they become a pest, you know, because they're so tame. And of course, they'll be in the garden, people will start feeding them, and then you can't get rid of them. So I head to the hills, and it's not long before I see my first wild Eriske ponies. This is what it's all about for me. The ponies just look so happy up there. Something truly special about seeing a native pony in its natural habitat. This breed came close to extinction in the 1970s as the need for working ponies diminished. But on my next stop, I find out why they're once again an essential part of island life. I'm on my fourth day travelling up through the Outer Hebrides with my dog Inca and my two ponies Noah and Storm. I've arrived on Eriske, where their breed got their name. This is literally heaven. Eriske ponies were down to their last 20 in the 1970s, but thanks to the work of many dedicated local people, their numbers are back up to around 420 worldwide. Donald John McInnes's family have lived on the island for generations and used them as working ponies on their small holdings, known as crofts. 
all the crofters here would have had a pony at one time. It was a vital part of having a croft and working a croft. The ponies would have been used for all manner of jobs, but as demand for them fell, so did their numbers. But now, once again, they're an important part of island life. They, they are a tourist attraction. They are quite popular with the tourists. They are good for the, for the island. You know, this time of year, if you look around, the place is nice and green. If there wasn't anything grazing on the island this time of year, it wouldn't be that green. It would be, it would be overrun. As for my two ponies, I've had to keep them separate from the wild herd, as it can take weeks for newcomers to be accepted. But they're certainly enjoying their native homeland. Now and Storm seem so happy to be able to just roam free. It's really nice seeing them getting to live like a true Eriskay pony. But Eriskay is not just famous for its ponies. Their local football pitch is recognised by FIFA as one of the most remarkable places to play in the world. The first thing you notice is the pitch. Is <laughs> How do they play on it? I don't know. From this corner, it goes straight downhill. After a bumpy and wet game, Eriskay snatch a 4-3 win. At the island's only pub, I joined Martin McCauley and Sean McKinnon for a celebratory drink. But with such a small population on the island, it can be tough to rustle up a team. It's a lot of uh, phony around, a couple of nights beforehand, and boys going away to work, and we get there in the end. And what do other teams make of your incredible pitch here? Uh, well, they moan a lot. You hear some moaning, groaning about it, but the pitch has been there for 50, 60 years. It's unique. Although there are six main islands, the Outer Hebrides is made up of hundreds of little ones as well, with most uninhabited. And I'm camping on one of them tonight. But to get there, we need to cross a tidal causeway, which is only possible when the tide has gone out. Well, at the moment, the road just runs into the sea. We have to wait four hours, but it's worthwhile. as it shows just how brilliant these ponies are. This tidal causeway is nearly a mile and a half long and allows the ponies to get up a bit of speed. Oh, my word. That was so much fun. <sighs> the ponies were, like, canting along and the spray was going everywhere. It's just awesome. Our only companions on the island are some highland cows who seem rather pleased to have some company. Here, yeah, guys, are awesome. But after I set up camp, the rain comes in again. One minute it's really sunny and nice, and the next minute it's pouring in rain. I mean, literally deluges of water just fall out of the sky. And in the morning, the journey back across the causeway is horrendous. I'm absolutely soaked covered in sand, and I really feel like I need a coffee and some hot breakfast. The locals are obviously used to their challenging climate and have their own weather forecaster, a swinging rock which tells them how bad the weather is. <laughs> Definitely wet and windy, according to the rock. When I get warmed up, the ponies have to wait outside. Sorry, boys, just going to pack in. But this is just a pit stop, as we still have plenty more miles to cover. The journey's going to get tougher as we head to the largest and most mountainous islands of Lewis and Harris. And I'll be getting close to some of the fantastic wildlife that inhabits these islands. Hey! <laughs> you got it! So far, I've travelled nearly 100 miles on my journey from the southern island of Vatasay, heading to the most northerly tip of the Outer Hebrides. The weather has been pretty awful for the last few days. So arriving on the Isle of Harris, my first stop is to pick up some warm weather clothing. Hi there. Hi. Hello. Harris Tweed is renowned and sold all over the world, and everything is made on the island. Marion McLennan was born here and works in this shop during her holidays, and she's also a student at the University of Glasgow. But getting used to a big city compared to life on the island was a bit of a culture shock. You know, it was so different from being here, it was so busy and everything, but actually, I've been there for three years now, so I get the busy kind of city life for my term time and then I come back here and it's a bit quieter and I really enjoy it because it's two completely contrasting places. All Harry's tweed is woven by hand in the homes of the islanders. 
It's very popular um, and it gives people jobs. Um, it's also, I think, put Harris on the map a little bit, so we're very proud of it, I must say. You look very handsome. And sporting our new gear, we get on our way. Tourism here generates over £50 million every year and supports a 1,000 full-time jobs. During the summer months, fisherman Lewis McKenzie takes tourists out on boat trips to spot wildlife. And we're heading to an area where he regularly sees sea eagles, and he helps them with food to try and bolster numbers. Perfect. So let's just see what happens. And we don't have to wait long. Here and he comes, here he comes. Now quickly, here oh, wow. wow. There he is. Oh, you've dropped it. It might come round again. Oh, he's embarrassed. <laughs> Unfortunately, he doesn't return. But it's not long before another regular summer visitor appears that Lewis has affectionately named Barry. Barry! <laughs> Barry is a great skewer who likes a free meal. He's been coming back here for the last five years. We have this kind of a routine every day where he follows the boat looking for a bit of fish. And he gets annoyed if I don't have anything, so he did well to get something today. After a quick bit of fishing and crab catching, we head back to shore with my supper. Oh, it's so good. Really loved going out on the boat with Lewis today. Not just getting to see all the amazing marine life that surrounds this coastline, but also getting to see his relationship with the animals. It's apparent that to live here, the locals have had to be resourceful. Donald McSween is a crofter, and for generations his family have been digging peat on their land. So what exactly is peat? Peat is uh, it's, it's carbon, basically. So I like to think of it as similar to coal, but without the heat and the pressure applied. As you can see all around us, there are no trees, so there's no option of burning wood, and there hasn't been for probably a few thousand years. So this stuff has been vital for the survival of people here in the Western Isles for umpteen generations. As a crofter, Donald's allowed to cut peat, but only enough for his own use. He's been working the land for around 12 years, but like most islanders, to survive financially, he's had to diversify. The main thing about crofting really is that you've got to have another source of income, and most people do. My mother was a teacher and a crofter, my father was a fisherman and a crofter, I worked part-time for the local council myself. So there are uh, lots of similarities, traditional ways of working, but there's a modern twist to it too. So after nearly three weeks of horse boarding, we're on the final leg through the Outer Hebrides. I can see the lighthouse. Just a few metres left to go. And after 186 miles, I reach journey's end. Well done, boys. We've made it. I've absolutely loved exploring the islands here, from Vatasay right down south to here in the Butt of Lewis. Every single pocket and every corner you go around is completely different. There's so much to see and experience. You could literally spend months here and still have more to see. It's been amazing. <laughs>